The Moors murders were carried out by Ian Brady and Myra Hindley between July 1963 and October 1965, in and around Manchester, England. The victims were five children, aged between 10 and 17. In January 1961, 18-year-old Hindley soon became infatuated with Brady, despite learning that he had a criminal record. Hindley began a diary, and although she had dates with other men, some of the entries detail her fascination with Brady, to whom she eventually spoke for the first time on the 27th of July. Over the next few months she continued to make entries, but grew increasingly disillusioned with him, until the 22nd of December when Brady asked her on a date to the cinema. Their dates followed a regular pattern, a trip to the cinema, usually to watch an X-rated film, then back to Hindley's house to drink German wine. Brady then gave her reading material, and the pair spent their work lunch breaks reading aloud to one another from accounts of Nazi atrocities. Hindley began to emulate an ideal of Aryan perfection, bleaching her hair blonde and applying thick crimson lipstick. She expressed concern at some aspects of Brady's character. In a letter to a childhood friend, she mentioned an incident where she had been drugged by Brady, but also wrote of her obsession with him. A few months later, she asked her friend to destroy the letter. In her 30,000-word plea for parole, written in 1978 and 1979 and submitted to Home Secretary Merlin Rees, Hindley said. Within months he had convinced me that there was no God at all, he could have told me that the earth was flat, the moon was made of green cheese and the sun rose in the west, I would have believed him. Such was his power of persuasion. Hindley began to change her appearance further, wearing clothing considered risque such as high boots, short skirts and leather jackets, and the two became less sociable to their colleagues. The couple were regulars at the library, borrowing books on philosophy, as well as crime and torture. They also read works by the Marquis de Chardet, Friedrich Nietzsche and Fyodor Dostoevsky's Crime and Punishment. Although Hindley was not a qualified driver, she often hired a van, in which the couple planned bank robberies. Hindley befriended George Clitheroe, the president of the Cheadle Rifle Club, and on several occasions visited two local shooting ranges. Clitheroe, although puzzled by her interest, arranged for her to buy a 22 rifle from a gun merchant in Manchester. She also asked to join a pistol club, but she was a poor shot and allegedly often bad-tempered, so Clitheroe told her that she was unsuitable, she did though manage to purchase a Webley 45 and a Smith & Wesson 38 from other members of the club. Brady and Hindley's plans for robbery came to nothing, but they became interested in photography. Brady already owned a box brownie, which he used to take photographs of Hindley and her dog puppet, but he upgraded to a more sophisticated model and also purchased lights and darkroom equipment. The pair took photographs of each other that for the time, would have been considered explicit. For Hindley, this demonstrated a marked change from her earlier, more shy and prudish nature. Brady moved in with Hindley at her grandmother's house in Bannock Street. On 12 July 1963, Brady told Hindley that he wanted to commit the perfect murder. After work he instructed her to drive a borrowed van around while he followed on his motorcycle. When he spotted a likely victim he would flash his headlight. Driving down Gorton Lane, Brady saw a young girl and signalled Hindley, who did not stop because she recognised the girl as an eight-year-old neighbour of her mother. Sometime after 7.30pm, on Froxma Street, Brady signalled Hindley to stop for 16-year-old Pauline Reed, a schoolmate of Hindley's sister Maureen on her way to a dance, Hindley offered Reed a lift. At various times Hindley gave conflicting statements about the extent to which she versus Brady, was responsible for Reed being selected as their first victim, but said she felt that there would be less attention given to the disappearance of a teenager than of an eight-year-old. Once Reed was in the van, Hindley asked her to help in searching Saddleworth more for an expensive lost glove, Reed agreed and they drove there. When Brady arrived on his motorcycle, Hindley told Reed he would be helping in the search. Hindley later claimed that she waited in the van while Brady took Reed onto the moor. Brady returned alone after about 30 minutes, and took Hindley to the spot where Reed lay dying. Reed's clothes were in disarray and she had been nearly decapitated by two cuts to the throat, including a four-inch incision across her voice box inflicted with considerable force and into which the collar of her coat and a throat chain had been pushed. When Hindley asked Brady whether he had raped Reed, Brady replied, of course I did. 
Hindley stayed with Reed while Brady retrieved a spade he had hidden nearby on a previous visit, then returned to the van while Brady buried Reed. In Brady's account, Hindley was not only present for the attack, but participated in the sexual assault. In the early evening of 23 November 1963, at a market in ashton underline Brady and Hindley offered 12-year-old John Kilbride a lift home, saying his parents might worry that he was out so late. They also promised him a bottle of sherry. Once Kilbride was inside Hindley's hired Ford Anglia car, Brady said they would have to make a detour to their home for the sherry. En route he suggested another detour, this time to search for a glove Hindley had lost on the moor. When they reached the moor Brady took Kilbride with him while Hindley waited in the car, Brady sexually assaulted Kilbride and tried to slit his throat with a six-inch serrated blade before strangling him with a shoelace or string. Early in the evening of 16 June 1964, Hindley asked 12-year-old Keith Bennett, who was on his way to his grandmother's house in Longsight, for help in loading some boxes into her mini pickup, after which she said she would drive him home. Brady was in the back of the van. Hindley drove to a lay-by on Saddleworth Moor and Brady went off with Bennett, supposedly looking for a lost glove. After about 30 minutes Brady returned alone, carrying a spade that he had hidden there earlier, and, in response to Hindley's questions, said that he had sexually assaulted Bennett and strangled him with a piece of string. Brady and Hindley visited a funfair in Ancoats on 26 December 1964 and noticed that 10-year-old Leslie Ann Downey was apparently alone. They approached her and deliberately dropped some shopping they were carrying, then asked her help in taking the packages to their car, and then to Wardlebrook Avenue. At the house Downey was undressed, gagged, and forced to pose for photographs before being raped and killed, perhaps strangled with a piece of string. Hindley later maintained that she went to fill a bath for Downey and found her dead when she returned, Brady claimed that Hindley killed Downey. The following morning Brady and Hindley drove Downey's body to Saddleworth Moor, and buried her, naked with her clothes at her feet, in a shallow grave. On the evening of 6 October 1965, Hindley drove Brady to Manchester Central Railway Station, where she waited outside in the car whilst he selected a victim. After a few minutes Brady reappeared in the company of 17-year-old Edward Evans, an apprentice engineer who lived in Ardwick, to whom he introduced Hindley as his sister. Brady later claimed that he had picked up Evans for a sexual encounter. They drove to Brady and Hindley's home at Wardlebrook Avenue, where they relaxed over a bottle of wine. At some point Brady sent Hindley to fetch David Smith, her brother-in-law. Hindley's family had not approved of Maureen's marriage to Smith, who had several criminal convictions, including actual bodily harm and housebreaking, the first of which, wounding with intent, occurred when he was 11. Throughout the previous year Brady had been cultivating a friendship with Smith, who had become in awe of Brady, something that increasingly worried Hindley as she felt it compromised their safety. Hindley returned with Smith and told him to wait outside for her signal, a flashing light. When the signal came, Smith knocked on the door and was met by Brady, who asked if he had come for the miniature wine bottles, and left him in the kitchen saying that he was going to collect the wine. Smith later told the police. I waited about a minute or two then suddenly I heard a hell of a scream, it sounded like a woman, really high pitched. Then the screams carried on, one after another really loud. Then I heard Myra shout, Dave, help him, very loud. When I ran in I just stood inside the living room and I saw a young lad. He was lying with his head and shoulders on the couch and his legs were on the floor. He was facing upwards. Ian was standing over him, facing him, with his legs on either side of the young lad's legs. The lad was still screaming. Ian had a hatchet in his hand, he was holding it above his head and he hit the lad on the left side of his head with the hatchet. I heard the blow, it was a terrible hard blow, it sounded horrible. Smith then watched Brady throttle Evans with a length of electrical cord. Brady sprained his ankle in the struggle, and Evans' body was too heavy for Smith to carry to the car on his own, so they wrapped it in plastic sheeting and put it in the spare bedroom. Smith agreed to return the following morning with his baby's pram, for use in transporting Evans' body to the car before disposing of it on the moor. He arrived home around 3 a.m. and asked his wife to make a cup of tea, which he drank before vomiting and telling her what he had witnessed. 
At 6.10 a.m., having waited for daylight and arming himself with a screwdriver and bread knife, in case Brady was planning to intercept him, Smith called the police from a phone box on the estate. He was picked up by a police car from the phone box and taken to Hyde Police Station, where he told officers what he had witnessed in the night. Superintendent Bob Talbot of the Staley Bridge Police Division went to Wardle Brook Avenue, accompanied by a detective sergeant. Wearing a bread deliveryman's overall on top of his uniform, he asked Hindley at the back door if her husband was home. When she denied that she had a husband or that a man was in the house, Talbot identified himself. Hindley led him into the living room, where Brady was lying on a divan, writing to his employer about his ankle injury. Talbot explained that he was investigating, an act of violence involving guns, that was reported to have taken place the previous evening. Hindley denied there had been any violence, and allowed police to look around the house. When police asked for the key to the locked spare bedroom, she said it was at her workplace, but after police offered to take her to retrieve it, Brady told her to hand it over. When police returned to the living room they arrested Brady on suspicion of murder. As Brady was getting dressed, he said, Eddie and I had a row and the situation got out of hand. Though Hindley was not initially arrested, she demanded to go with Brady to the police station, taking her dog. She refused to make any statement about Evan's death beyond claiming it had been an accident, and was allowed to go home on the condition that she return the next day. Over the next four days Hindley visited her employer and asked to be dismissed so that she would be eligible for unemployment benefits. On one of these occasions, she found an envelope belonging to Brady which she burned in an ashtray, she claimed she did not open it but believed it contained plans for bank robberies. On the 11th of October, she too was arrested and taken into custody, being charged as an accessory to the murder of Evans and was remanded at HM Prison Risley. Police searching the house at Wardle Brook Avenue found an old exercise book with the name, John Kilbride, which made them suspect that Brady and Hindley had been involved in the disappearances of other youngsters. Brady told police that he and Evans had fought, but insisted that he and Smith had murdered Evans and that Hindley had only done what she had been told. Smith said that Brady had asked him to return anything incriminating, such as dodgy books, which Brady then packed into suitcases. He had no idea what else the suitcases contained or where they might be, though he mentioned that Brady had a thing about railway stations. A search of left luggage offices turned up the suitcases at Manchester Central Railway Station on 15 October. The claim ticket was later found in Hindley's prayer book. Inside one of the cases were among an assortment of costumes, notes, photographs and negatives, nine pornographic photographs taken of Downey, naked and with a scarf tied across her mouth, and a 16-minute audio tape recording of a girl identifying herself as Leslie Ann Weston, screaming, crying, and pleading to be allowed to return home to her mother. Downey's mother later confirmed that the recording, too, was of her daughter. Officers making inquiries at neighboring houses spoke to 12-year-old Patricia Hodges, who had on several occasions been taken to Saddleworth Mall by Brady and Hindley, and was able to point out their favorite sites along the A635 road. Police immediately began to search the area, and on 16 October found an arm bone protruding from the peat, which was presumed at first to be Kilbride's, but which the next day was identified as that of Downey, whose body was still visually identifiable. Her mother was able to identify the clothing which had also been buried in the grave. Also among the photographs in the suitcase were a number of scenes of the Moors. Smith had told police that Brady had boasted of photographic proof of multiple murders, and officers struck by Brady's decision to remove the apparently innocent landscapes from the house appealed to locals for assistance finding locations to match the photographs. On the 21st of October they found the badly decomposed body of Kilbride, which had to be identified by clothing. That same day, already being held for the murder of Evans, Brady and Hindley appeared at Hyde Magistrates Court charged with Downey's murder. Each was brought before the court separately and remanded into custody for a week. They made a two-minute appearance on 28 October, and were again remanded into custody. 
the investigating officers suspected Brady and Hindley of murdering other missing children and teenagers who had disappeared from areas in and around Manchester over the previous few years, and the search for bodies continued after the discovery of Kilbride's body, but with winter setting in it was called off in November. Presented with the evidence of the tape recording, Brady admitted to taking the photographs of Downey, but insisted that she had been brought to Wardlebrook Avenue by two men who had subsequently taken her away again, alive. By the 2nd of December, Brady had been charged with the murders of Kilbride, Downey and Evans. Hindley had been charged with the murders of Downey and Evans, and being an accessory to the murder of Kilbride. At the committal hearing on 6 December, Brady was charged with the murders of Evans, Kilbride, and Downey, and Hindley with the murders of Evans and Downey, as well as with Habering Brady in the knowledge that he had killed Kilbride. Many of the photographs taken by Brady and Hindley on the mall featured Hindley's dog puppet, sometimes as a puppy. To help date the photos, detectives had a veterinary surgeon examine the dog to determine his age. The examination required a general anesthetic from which puppet did not recover. Hindley was furious, and accused the police of murdering the dog, one of the few occasions detectives witnessed any emotional response from her. Hindley wrote to her mother, I feel as though my heart's been torn to pieces. I don't think anything could hurt me more than this has. The only consolation is that some moron might have got hold of Puppet and hurt him. The 14-day trial, before Justice Fenton Atkinson, began on 19 April 1966, the courtroom was fitted with security screens to protect Brady and Hindley, who were charged with murdering Evans, Downey and Kilbride. David Smith was the chief prosecution witness. Both Brady and Hindley entered pleas of not guilty. Brady testified for over eight hours, Hindley for six. Brady admitted to striking Evans with the axe, but claimed that someone else had killed Evans, pointing to the pathologist's statement that his death had been accelerated by strangulation. Brady's calm, undisguised arrogance did not endear him to the jury and neither did his pedantry, wrote Duncan Staff. Hindley denied any knowledge that the photographs of Saddleworth Moor found by police had been taken near the graves of their victims. The 16-minute tape recording of Downey, on which the voices of Brady and Hindley were audible, was played in open court. Hindley admitted that her attitude towards Downey was brusque and cruel, but claimed that was only because she was afraid that someone might hear Downey screaming. Hindley claimed that when Downey was being undressed she herself was downstairs, and when the pornographic photographs were taken she was looking out the window, and that when Downey was being strangled she was running a bath. On 6 May, after having deliberated for a little over two hours, the jury found Brady guilty of all three murders, and Hindley guilty of the murders of Downey and Evans. As the death penalty for murder had been abolished while Brady and Hindley were held on remand, the judge passed the only sentence that the law allowed, life imprisonment. Brady was sentenced to three concurrent life sentences and Hindley was given two, plus a concurrent seven-year term for habering Brady in the knowledge that he had murdered Kilbride. Brady was taken to HM Prison Durham and Hindley was sent to HM Prison Holloway. In 1985, Brady allegedly told Fred Harrison, a journalist working for the Sunday People, that he had killed Reed and Bennett, something the police already suspected as both lived near Brady and Hindley and had disappeared at about the same time as Kilbride and Downey. Greater Manchester Police reopened the investigation, now to be headed by Detective Chief Superintendent Peter Topping, head of GMP's Criminal Investigation Department. On 3 July 1985, DCS Topping visited Brady, then being held at HM Prison Gartry in Leicestershire, but found him scornful of any suggestion that he had confessed to more murders. Police nevertheless decided to resume their search of Saddleworth Moor, once more using the photographs taken by Brady and Hindley to help them identify possible burial sites. In November 1986, Bennett's mother wrote to Hindley begging to know what had happened to her son, a letter that Hindley seemed to be genuinely moved by. It ended, I am a simple woman, I work in the kitchens of Christie's Hospital. It has taken me five weeks labor to write this letter because it is so important to me that it is understood by you for what it is, a plea for help. Please, Miss Hindley, help me. Police visited Hindley, then being held in HM Prison Cookham Wood in Kent, a few days after she received the letter, 
and although she refused to admit any involvement in the killings, she agreed to help by looking at photographs and maps to try to identify spots she had visited with Brady. She showed particular interest in photos of the area around Holland Brown Knoll and Shiny Brook, but said that it was impossible to be sure of the locations without visiting the moor. Home Secretary Douglas Heard agreed with DCS topping that a visit would be worth risking despite security problems presented by threats against Hindley. Writing in 1989, Topping said that he felt quite cynical about Hindley's motivation in helping the police. Although Winnie Johnson's letter may have played a part, he believed that Hindley, knowing of Brady's precarious mental state, was concerned he might cooperate with the police and reap any available public approval benefit. On 16 December 1986, Hindley made the first of two visits to assist the police search of the moor. Police closed all roads onto the moor, which was patrolled by 200 officers, some armed. Hindley and her solicitor left Cookham Wood at 4.30 a.m., flew to the moor by helicopter from an airfield near Maidstone, and then were driven, and walked, around the area until 3 p.m. Hindley had difficulty connecting what she saw to her memories, and was apparently nervous of the helicopters flying overhead. The press described the visit as a fiasco, a publicity stunt, and a mindless waste of money, but DCS Topping defended it, saying, we needed a thorough systematic search of the moor. It would never have been possible to carry out such a search in private. On 10 February 1987 Hindley formally confessed to involvement in all five murders, but this was not made public for more than a month. Police visited Brady in prison again and told him of Hindley's confession, which at first he refused to believe. Once presented with some of the details that Hindley had provided of Reed's abduction, Brady decided that he too was prepared to confess, but on one condition, that immediately afterwards he be given the means to commit suicide, a request with which it was impossible for the authorities to comply. Over the next few months interest in the search waned, but information Hindley had given police had focused efforts on a specific area. On the 1st of July, after more than 100 days of searching, they found Pauline Reed's body three feet below the surface, 100 yards from where Leslie Ann Downies had been found. Brady had been cooperating with the police for some time, and when this news reached him he made a formal confession to DCS Topping, and in a statement to the press said that he too would help police in their search. He was taken to the moor on the 3rd of July but seemed to lose his bearings, blaming changes in the intervening years, the search was called off at 3 p.m., by which time a large crowd of press and television reporters had gathered on the moor. DCS Topping refused to allow Brady a second visit to the moor before police called off their search on the 24th of August. Brady was taken to the moor a second time on the 8th of December, and claimed to have located Keith Bennett's burial site, but the body was never found. During several years of interactions with forensic psychologist Chris Cowley, including face-to-face -face meetings, Brady told him of an aesthetic fascination he had with guns, despite his never having used one to kill. He complained bitterly about conditions at Ashworth, which he hated. In 1999, his right wrist was broken in what he claimed was an hour-long, unprovoked attack by staff. Brady subsequently went on hunger strike, but while English law allows patients to refuse treatment, those being treated for mental disorders under the Mental Health Act 1983 have no such right if the treatment is for their mental disorder. He was therefore force-fed and transferred to another hospital for tests after he fell ill. Brady recovered and in March 2000 asked for a judicial review of the legality of the decision to force feed him, but was refused permission. In 2012, Brady applied to be returned to prison, reiterating his desire to starve himself to death. At a mental health tribunal in June the following year, he claimed that he suffered not from paranoid schizophrenia, as his doctors at Ashworth maintained, but a personality disorder. Brady's application was rejected. After receiving end-of-life care, Brady died of restrictive pulmonary disease at Ashworth Hospital on 15 May 2017. The inquest found that he died of natural causes and that his hunger strike had not been a contributory factor. Brady had refused food and fluids for more than 48 hours on various occasions, causing him to be fitted with a nasogastric tube, although his inquest noted that his body mass index was not a cause for concern. He was cremated without a ceremony, and his ashes disposed of at sea during the night.
On 15 November 2002, Hindley, aged 60 and a chain smoker, died from bronchial pneumonia at West Suffolk Hospital. She had been diagnosed with angina in 1999 and hospitalized after suffering a brain aneurysm. Camera crews stood rank and file behind steel barriers outside, but none of Hindley's relatives were among the small congregation of 8 to 10 people who attended a short service at Cambridge Crematorium. Such was the strength of feeling more than 35 years after the murders, that a reported 20 local undertakers refused to handle her cremation. Four months later, her ashes were scattered by her ex-partner, Patricia Cairns less than 16 kilometers from Saddleworth Moor in Staley Bridge Country Park. Fears were expressed that the news might result in visitors choosing to avoid the park, a local beauty spot, or even that the park might be vandalized. Thanks for watching. For more videos please click like and subscribe.